God, thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you that, especially on a practical topic that should infect all of us, like hospitality, your word has so much to say. God, you know I have more to say this morning than I have time to say it. So I pray that you would grant me clarity, accuracy, efficiency. Uh, God, I pray for my hearers. I pray that this would not be merely an imparting of information. God, I, I pray that we would marvel at your love for us, that we would be motivated by the right things, that we would not be hearers only of your word, but you would make us doers to your glory, that you would more and more make us a church marked by hospitality as a result of your word, as a result of these messages. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so <clears throat> last week was part one. If you have not heard that, you can get it online. But the summary, the take-home message is that God's love demonstrated in the gospel is the fuel and foundation of our hospitality. God didn't just say he loved us, but he showed it by making us, while we were strangers, while we were his enemies, he made us his children at great cost to himself. He took us from being children of the devil, children of wrath, and made us children of God. And so our hospitality must be rooted in genuine love. And that's why the, the name of today's lesson and the whole point is our hospitality imitates, reveals, and spreads gospel love. The Greek word for hospitality, as we learned last week, it, it has two parts. Uh, it was literally brotherly love, Philadelphia to strangers. And that was a built-in reminder every time they used the word, every time they heard the word, built-in reminder for early Christians that this hospitality really was a gospel-imitating love for people who weren't their family. We get to treat people who are not our family as our family because God treated us and actually made us his family even while we weren't. So go to the next slide. I just want you to see this, that Every command to hospitality in the New Testament. These are the three major ones. There's other mentions of it, but these verses are the three major commands to hospitality. In every one of them, we see brotherly love, love for our brothers, true love in the near context. And this is consistent because if God's love is the foundation, example, and basis of our love for one another, we would expect outward expressions of that love to be tethered to commands to love. So you see here, uh, Romans 12, 9 and 13, the command overarching all of that section is let love be genuine. And then we see an outworking of that, being devoted to one another in Philadelphia, being devoted to one another in brotherly love. And an outworking of that genuine love is pursuit of hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9. Above all, be fervent in your love for one another. And then it says, be hospitable to one another. Hebrews 13. Let the love of brothers, let Philadelphia continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality. These verses reveal, and really the whole biblical teaching on hospitality reveals that the Christian practice of hospitality was not viewed in Bible times and must not be viewed now simply as a means of overcoming a practical need. It did overcome a practical need. If you think back to the very early, the very beginning of the Christian church, Acts 2, Acts 4, you see the immediate description of Christians. Things in common, meeting needs. You see Acts 6, as the, the early church was forming, 
They were marked by true love in meeting needs. But you see that hospitality wasn't simply a means of overcoming a practical problem or fulfilling a social requirement. Hospitality instead is a concrete expression of Christian love for blood-bought siblings brought into God's family through the death of our older brother Jesus and love for our father. So we're going to look at these verses bit by bit. We're not going to be able to to dig into each one of them and get everything we can out of them, but we're going to make 11 observations of what true hospitality must be from these verses. First, Christian hospitality must therefore be fervent and zealous. Fervent and zealous. So I'm getting this from 1 Peter 4, 8 primarily. So open up your Bibles to 1 Peter 4, verse 8. We're going to be there for our first few observations. I'll be bouncing around. You can try to follow me or just listen. But 1 Peter 4, 8 says, keep loving each other earnestly or fervently. And then the next command is, show hospitality to one another or seek to show hospitality. The Greek word here, do you see the keep loving one another earnestly? The the outflow of that is hospitality. That word earnestly, fervently, the, the Greek word here, it isn't focused on like a strength of emotion, like love each other with all your heart kind of thing. But instead it's, The image is like a taut muscle, a strenuous or sustained effort, like an athlete. It suggests a certain toughness of love that endures. I'm hearing a lot of echoes. Should I switch to the podium mic? Go podium mic. All right. So don't let love, the point here of this fervent and zealousness of of love, of hospitality, what you shouldn't think is, okay, I'll just let hospitality happen. I'll love when I get the opportunity, right? There's a fervency, a zealousness, a a taut straining of, of muscles. You don't just let this love happen. You don't just let hospitality happen. You strive for it. The earnest, fervent love will have a number of of different manifestations, not hospitality merely, right? Like forgiving, like serving, but naturally hospitality, which is the next verse after this 1 Peter 4, 8 command. Hospitality must be one of them. Alexander Strock says it pretty simply and accurately. He says, hospitality is a concrete, down-to-earth test of our fervent love for God and his people. We'll see that played out later. Um, you can, your mind might already be jumping to some clear biblical examples of that. We'll get to that in some, some later observations. Similarly, Hebrews 13.2 it says, don't neglect hospitality, right? Your hospitality must be fervent. Don't neglect it. It shouldn't be passive. Hospitality must be an active, fervent pursuit. Romans 12, 9, our other verse, there's nothing passive about the context in which the command for hospitality arises. Right, Hebrews or Romans 12, 9 through 13, it's one large idea. There's a, a main verb and then a, a bunch of, of subordinate verbs after that. And you see that the call for genuine without hypocrisy love, and then all the verbs are participles functioning as commands, and that explains the way that that genuine love is to be played out. Romans 12, 9, he says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being devoted. Do you see those, those verbs aren't passive verbs? There's a fervency. There's a zealousness to abhorring, clinging, devoted. Now look at these other active words, not lagging in diligence, being fervent in spirit. 
And then you get to the command in Romans 12, 13 to show hospitality. It's the last of a list built on the foundation of genuine agape love, a love that's fervent and zealous. And so genuine love crescendos through this list in Romans 12. Through brotherly love, preferring one another, diligence, fervency, persevering, devotion and prayer, and it culminates in meeting needs in hospitality. And it's not just showing hospitality, but pursuing hospitality. There must be nothing passive, indifferent, apathetic, half-hearted, or unmotivated in your love or your hospitality. There certainly wasn't in God's. His seeking us was very active, very costly. Jesus persevered till the end. I'd love for you to spend time looking at the command in, in Hebrews 12, one chapter before and really the context leading in to this Hebrews 13, one command for hospitality and seeing just how strenuously Jesus persevered all the way to the point of death on the cross. And that's your motivation for persevering in this race of faith as well. So we could spend a whole message on this point alone, but we have a second to go to. So let's go flip back to 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, 8. Christian hospitality must be sin covering, right? It must be fervent and zealous. It must also be sin covering. We see that because in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And then you get the command, show hospitality. Love, just think about what the word love means. Not in our world, not in our popular connotation, but biblically. Hopefully, 1 Corinthians 13 comes to mind. Right? If our hospitality flows out of love, Love is not irritable. Love isn't resentful. Love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The, these descriptions of love assume you will be sinned against, assume that you will be offended, and your love endures. It doesn't resent. It bears it. It covers it. And you're going to need this kind of love if you're going to have people in your home. It's just a practical reality. Don't only have the people over who don't challenge your love. It, that's a lot of negatives. Pursue people who are hard to love and pursue loving them in your home. This way your love, your hospitality will get to cover over sin. It's actually a great way to win a brother or sister from sin. You see, we're united to Christ as brothers, but we're not yet glorified. We saw that last week in 1 John 3, 1 through 3. We will sin against each other. And if you don't want to be sinned against, don't be around people. But for the Christian, that's not an option. If, if we should give our enemies food and drink, right, Romans 12, verse 20, shortly after the command to pursue hospitality there. And if we should overcome evil with good, how much more should we be gracious to our brothers and sisters in Christ when they sin against us and welcome them into our home? All right, you can have in mind the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matthew 18. If you hold a sin against a brother? What are you saying about the way that you hope God holds your sins against you? Think about the description of elders. What, what is a ministry of elders as we care for the flock? A big part of this is actually pursuing people when they're in sin to restore them in a spirit of gentleness, looking to ourselves, elders regularly help sheep out of their sin, help guard sheep from sin. 
through the ministry of the word. And this doesn't only happen in pulpits. It doesn't only happen from a lectern. Instead, elders are to have people in their homes and to be in people's homes. It was the example of Paul. He declared it clearly in Acts 20. And it's the qualification for elders. Elders must be hospitable. And this actually hits both lists. This is on the 1 Timothy 3 and the Titus 1 list. Elders provide shepherding, sin covering, one another care in their homes and in other people's homes. Homes are excellent locations to confess sins to one another and to pray for one another. That phrase, confess sins and pray for one another, comes from James chapter 5, verse 16. And in that context, that's right after where James commands, if somebody is sick and weary to the point where they need help praying, elders are to go to their homes and care for them physically, care for them spiritually. And then how do you guard yourself? How does the church guard itself from, getting, from keeping themselves from the point where the elders need to go on a rescue mission to their homes? Body on body, life on life, pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed from this heart-hardening effects of sin. Home is a great place to do this. Home is a natural place to do this. If we only do this in coffee shops, only do this in the rows at church, we're missing a great opportunity to have deeper conversations, get to know people better, care for real physical needs as we care for real spiritual needs. And in James 5, that chapter, that book ends after the elders, speaking of elders, going on a rescue mission to homes of people who are so weary that they can't even pray for themselves. Their perseverance is under threat. He says, my brothers, I love it. Remember, that's not a throwaway word. My brothers. This is verse 19 of James 5. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Love covers sins. Meeting physical and spiritual needs in homes is a great way in love to cover over sins. Back to 1 Peter 4. We got to keep moving. 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Christian hospitality must be without grumbling. Right? It says the command, be hospitable to one another. And then there's a modifying phrase, without grumbling. Why do you think that's there? Well, we already said if, if having people in your home is a great way to be sinned against, and you're having people in your home will have to cover over sin, the natural thing to do is to grumble. Don't grumble against one another. That ruins the hospitality, right? Love doesn't combine well with grumbling. You actually in that way reveal that you're not doing it for love. You're not doing it for the person, but you have your eyes on you. The way in which you do all things, especially the way in which you show hospitality, shows whose child you are. Not grumbling or arguing is directly linked to be in uh, Philippians. Philippians 2 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will be blameless and pure children of God totally makes sense. If we are, if God's children do things without grumbling, your hospitality will be marked by not grumbling. And so Jesus declares that we are to love as he loved us. By this, all people will know that we are his disciples. We will shine as lights in this world and the world will see our good deeds and glorify our father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Remember the, the, the quote that I had from 
the pagan Octavius, he was deriding Christians. Hardly have they met when they love each other indiscriminately. They call each other brother or sister. Even the pagans are forced to say, see how they love one another? What would a grumbling word heard by outsiders do to that testimony after a selfless show of hospitality? What does a grumbling word do to your heart after a selfless show of hospitality? Undermines, destroys everything that your hospitality is supposed to be aiming at. Grumbling takes the act from one of God glorifying selfless love to one of self-centered sin. So show hospitality without grumbling. I mean, it's all over the New Testament. God loves a cheerful giver, not a grumbling giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I'm going to read again from Alexander Strzok. You're going to hear a lot of that. His book, Hospitality Commands, it's on the book table. It's so good. It says, hospitality is a concrete, down-to-earth test of our fervent love for God and his people. I already read that, but it keeps going. He says, love can be an abstract, indistinct idea. Hospitality, though, is specific, intangible. We seldom complain about loving others too much, but we do complain about the inconvenience of hospitality. Hospitality is love in action. Hospitality is the flesh and muscle on the bones of love. Through caring acts of hospitality, the reality of our love is tested. Consider what grumbling reveals. Consider what joy reveals after hospitality and make sure you're not aiming at the act only, but let your grumbling or lack thereof reveal what's going on in your heart, motivating the act. Number four, back to 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, 10, the next command is, as each of you, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. There's a series of three one another commands. Keep loving one another earnestly, show hospitality without grumbling, and then serve one another. So Christian hospitality must be humble in service. The heart of service is Jesus emulating humility, right? Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In that way, each of us is to look not to our own interests, but also the interests of others. Just as Jesus did, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Right? Secular entertaining is a terrible bondage. If, you, if you're bound to say, I got to get my house perfect so that people think highly of me when they come over. I have to have everything in line. Oh man, if, if the meal isn't on at just the right time and just the right temperature, if the table isn't set just right, if the kids don't act just right, whatever you have is the mark of hospitality. And those are good things to aim at. You can actually show love for others when you pay attention to details. But secular entertaining that says, I want to show hospitality so you think much of me, that's a terrible bondage. It's not rooted in service. It's not rooted in humility. Secular entertaining source is human pride. It demands perfection and it fosters the urge to impress. It's a rigorous taskmaster that enslaves. Right? In contrast, biblical hospitality flows from a, a freedom. It's a freedom that liberates. Entertaining says, I want to impress you with my beautiful home, my clever decorating, my gourmet cooking. Hospitality, on the other hand, seeks to make much of the other one, seeks to minister. It says, this home isn't mine anyway. It's a gift from my father. I'm his slave. I'm his son, his daughter, and I seek to use it as he desires to make much of you as he's made much of me. Hospitality doesn't try to impress. 
It tries to serve. And if we look back at 1 Peter 4, right? Use, as you've received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. What this speaks to is that your hospitality must five be an overflow of God's provision. Whoever serves, serves in the strength that God supplies. Let's consider back to to Romans. You know how Romans 12 has the command, be hospitable, flowing from genuine love. That whole chapter 12 begins with the therefore. It looks back. I just want to read Romans 8.32 to remind you of God's provision. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Then 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Therefore, because of those mercies, I appeal to you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Let love be genuine. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. I jumped over a lot of verses by showing the continuity there. Our seeking to show hospitality doesn't flow from our own strength, our own provision. It flows from, reflects, and magnifies God's. That's why our hospitality must seek to imitate, must seek to reveal, and must seek to spread gospel love. When you're using your stuff, don't think of, oh, this is my stuff. Aren't I generous? This is God's stuff that he gave you as a steward to use. When you and I have the privilege of using that stuff, our home, our time, our gifts, our efforts to make much of others, to show them practical love, to meet their needs. That should remind us every minute that we're doing that. This isn't mine. This is God's for him. The command is in Matthew 25, 31. We're going to keep looking at this. I just want you to to flip there real fast to see so that you have how clearly hospitality is in Jesus's mind. This is speaking of the tribulation saints, how they are marked by faith in their hospitality to one another. I'm going to read it now. You might be like, why are you reading it here? Why are you reading it under this point? And I'm going to be referring back to this a lot. The reason why I'm reading it here is Jesus put it right after and in the context of the parable of the talents, where we're taught of the importance of our stewardship of that which God has entrusted to his servants. The way in which you use that which God has entrusted you reveals what you believe about God. So look here and and see the point that your hospitality or lack thereof is revealing of whether or not you have saving faith. This is going to be true of the tribulation saints. It's true of us now. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, verse 31 of Matthew 25, and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, look at the family language here. Jesus has these familial connections in mind and God's provision of stuff in mind, as he's saying this, he says, come, you who, you who are blessed by my father, inherit, family language, the kingdom 
prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. There's that hospitality word. And you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king, Jesus, our older brother, will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? And then he answered them saying, truly, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If we look at the means and if the tribulation saints or those who claim to be look at their provisions as meager as they are and say, I need to keep these for myself. If they look at a brother or sister and say, nope, this is mine, not yours. They're forgetting that they have a common father and God's given us our stuff, not for our good only, but so that we can be generous and give. Our hospitality must be an overflow of God's provision for us, his talents that he's given us in, in the parable above. And it must flow from a recognition of our relationship to the one who provided us that stuff, a faith in God, and a recognition of the new blood-bought relationship that he's made for us with each other in Christ. We'll get back to that later on the point in the future where Christian hospitality reveals saving faith. Let's go flip over to Romans 12, 9. We're going to keep going through the list of descriptors of Christian hospitality. This one is almost silly to make. The point is silly to make right now because we've already been saying it's the foundation of all hospitality, but I, I want to dwell on it again for a second Christian hospitality must be genuinely loving. Let genuine love continue, or let love be without hypocrisy. Pursue hospitality. That's the flow there. This is a subordinate verb, the, the hospitality in, in Romans 12, 13, coming from the main command of genuine love in Romans 12, 9. It's easy to look loving, but actually be seeking your own. It's easy to look loving and actually be seeking your own. And in some ways, that kind of love defines every non-believer's effort to love. At some point, they're actually saying, what's in this for me? I'm doing, I'm loving because ultimately it makes me feel good. I'm loving in some way. A non-believer's love falls short of what you, the Christian, can do in your love, where you're imitating God's truly selfless, genuine love. Love, 1 Corinthians 13, 5, does not seek its own. Genuine love will not be partial. It will be given to those who cannot repay. Right? Think back to Matthew 25, 40. What you did to the least of these, my brothers, the ones who had no chance to ever repay, 
who are in the greatest need. You've done to me. Jesus, in Luke 14, 12, he's speaking to a man who showed him hospitality. He said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Alexander Strock comments, he says, in order to use our homes effectively, we need to expand our vision of hospitality. When we think of hospitality, we most often think of entertaining close friends and relatives because we're closest to these people. We naturally want to invite them into our home. Our Lord acknowledges this closeness, but also commands us to extend the circle of hospitality to include unrelated and needy people. It's okay for you to invite your friends. Show them selfless love. When we're united in the body of Christ, we will become close. People who you naturally wouldn't have relationship with are now more close to you in reality than even your natural brothers and sisters. Have them over. Show them selfless love. But if you're only having close friends over, if you're never extending use of your home to people who can't repay, that's just that warning bells off. I'm going to continue what Alexander Strzok writes. He says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite only your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, like Jesus says. There's nothing wrong with dining with friends and relatives. Such occasions are essential to family relationships and friendships. Our Lord himself enjoyed dining with close friends and loved ones. For example, the home of Mary, Martha, Lazarus, was one of his favorite places. But Jesus was most noted for dining with the undesirables, unknown, even irreligious people. Like in Luke 19, 1 through 10. And so in Luke 14, Jesus teaches his disciples to welcome the unwelcome, the unwelcomed. Jesus says, open your homes to those who are neglected, alone, and uninvited. Thus, the practice of Christian hospitality is truly distinct from the world's practice of hospitality because it reaches out to the unwanted to needy people who cannot reciprocate. For many people, question in your heart if this is you. For many people, hospitality, if it is practiced, is practiced only or primarily to meet their own social needs. Sometimes it's a self-glorifying show to impress others with your home or entertainment skill. In contrast, Christian hospitality is humble, sacrificial service. And if it is humble and sacrificial, it will be shown to those who cannot repay because Christian hospitality shows genuine love. I just want to remind you, lonely people exist within our church. There's lonely people in our church. You might be one who... After church, you have a list of people who you want to get together with that that's reaches on into next year and beyond. There's also people who come to church just hoping that they get to have a meal with somebody. Come in, leave, nothing. That can't be the way here, guys. Our church, we're going to talk about this next week, hunting hospitality, pursuing hospitality, we're going to look for showing opportunities to show hospitality to those who can't repay, to those who need it. 
we are naturally going to show preference. This is naturally in our sinful self. Show preference to those who are like us, maybe those who can repay, those who are honorable in the world's eyes. James 2, though, says, James 1, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Where he goes is don't show partiality. Don't show partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus. What's a way that that might happen? He says, well, if a man comes in wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, right? Suit, well done hair, whatever. He looks like you. He looks nice. He probably won't mess up your stuff. And you say, oh, come in, sit here, sit in a good place. And you're like, yeah, that's a guy I could have over to my house. He looks safe. Then you've made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. James says, listen my beloved brothers. He just constantly is reminding us of, of our relationship. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who loved him? The practice of Christian hospitality is distinct from the world's practice of hospitality, because it reaches out to the unwanted. Christian hospitality number seven, we're going to get this from Romans 12, 9, and 13. It lovingly and sacrificially meets needs. Lovingly and sacrificially meets needs. Where do I get that? Well, look at verse 13, right? Genuine love contributes to the needs of the saints, seeks to show hospitality. Alexander Strzok says, hospitality fleshes out love in a uniquely personal and sacrificial way. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share our most prized possessions. We share our family, our home, our finances, our food, our privacy, and our time. Indeed, we share our very lives. So hospitality is always costly. And hospitality seeks to meet true needs. I'm going to read to you Hebrews 2, 10 through 11. I'm going to jump through Hebrews 10, 2, 10 and 11, Hebrews 2, 14, and then Hebrews 3, 1. I'm going to read these back to back to back. Just listen. And consider the cost of Jesus's hospitality to meet our greatest need. As you say, do I, can I afford the cost of meeting others' needs sacrificially? Just close your eyes and listen. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood. He likewise partook of the same things that through death, he might destroy the one that has the power of death. That is the devil. Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, because of what Jesus did in dying for us and sanctifying us, suffering on the cross, he says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. Jesus was the one at great cost to himself. He was not ashamed to call us brothers. Out of the overflow of that, consider him. And that command is repeated throughout the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews ends, chapter 13. Brotherly love culminating in hospitality. 
Christian hospitality meets actual needs. James 1.27, describing true religion, who's it expressed towards? Orphans and widows in their distress. Next verse is the one where I said, don't show, don't show partiality. If you have a selfish love, you're going to show partiality to the rich guy who can repay. If you have a doer, not a hearer kind of love, rooted in God's word and the gospel message, you're going to care for orphans and widows in their distress because they have true needs. The context of 1 Peter 4 was persecution and the needs were great. If you had stuff, seek to show hospitality. Ultimately, the, one of the purposes of working hard as a Christian is to actually share your stuff. I love in, in Ephesians 4, you might, uh, this is one of my, my favorite verses in the Bible, um, because it, it shows the way that we turn away from sin. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him do honest work, right? If you're like, oh shoot, I'm, I'm sinning, I'm, I'm a, a thief. He doesn't say, all right, just stop stealing. <laughs> do the opposite, run all the way over to honest work, why? so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The, the mark of the Christian, and therefore the mark of our hospitality, is meeting needs. This was the mark of the early church. Peter preaches, thousands come to Christ. They had all things in common and met needs. Peter preaches again, more come to faith. More stuff in common, meeting needs. It wasn't saying, oh, Christianity is communism. Far from it. Everybody has their own stuff. There's rich, there's poor. The distinctions aren't abolished. But God uses the distinctions to meet needs in the body of Christ because we are all one. Number eight. True hospitality, Christian hospitality rooted in the gospel is used to spread the gospel message. Almost everything we've read in the Bible's overarching emphasis of hospitality is aimed Christian to Christian. It's Galatians 6.15. Let us not grow weary of doing good. We'll reap in due season if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. And you know what? The Bible's overarching emphasis on hospitality and spread of the gospel. This doesn't mean you can't use your stuff to reach out to non-believers. You should. But the point here, uh, thinking of, of the book of, of 3 John, Gaius is commended for his hospitality in the spread of the gospel as he hosted in his home missionaries, as he hosted uh, missionaries who were going out spreading the gospel, Gaius, in use of his home, John said, you are a fellow worker for the truth. You're not the one out in the field doing the work, but when you have a missionary, a preacher of the gospel in town, needs a place to stay, and you say, oh, my house is available, you're actually partnering with him. Use your home to spread the gospel in that way. I love this. As I read 3 John 5 through 8, note the words, brothers, strangers, and love as we read. I just want you to see, I'm not making up this emphasis. This just flows from the text. 3 John 5 through 8, he says, beloved, you're acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers and are doing this though they are strangers. Do you remember the word hospitality, brotherly love to strangers? That's the, that's the root word there. Do you see he's, he's saying, hey, as you're using your, you're showing hospitality, the work that you're doing for the brothers and are doing this, even though they're strangers, you didn't know them, but you know that they're brothers. Those guys bore witness to your love before the church. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that they may be fellow workers, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Gaius was commended. We can use that commendation and say, yeah, I want to use my stuff that way. I want to help brothers. I want to be fellow workers with my brothers, even if they're strangers. All of us are called to the mission. Not all of us are missionaries. 
If we don't go, we can be fellow workers with those who do through generous giving, using your stuff and your hospitality. Diotrephes, verse 9, is actually explicitly called out by John for his lack of hospitality. He refuses to welcome the brothers. That's evil. On the flip side, I want to consider this verse 9. Christian hospitality needs to be withheld from some. Christian hospitality needs to be withheld from some. Go back one book, 2 John 9 and 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, the true gospel, don't receive him in your home or give him any greeting, right? You're a fellow worker with those who you have in your home. And so if you enable a false, somebody preaching a false gospel, if you enable them to go out and continue to do that by saying, yeah, you can have a place to stay here. You're a fellow worker with a false teacher. Don't do that. Don't receive him into your home or give him any greeting. There's another group of people you should not use your home. You should not show hospitality to. 1 Corinthians 5. Here's what Paul says. He says, I am writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or as an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, then listen to what he says. So if you, if you have somebody who says he's a brother in his life, and this, this isn't just a, oh, I saw you do this one time, but he's not walking according to the faith. Our goal, what we ought to do to him is not to even eat with such a one, right? That's where you go to him one-on-one, -on -one, you warn him. If he won't listen, you bring two others along. If he won't listen to the two or three, you bring it to the church, if you won't listen even to the church, you treat him no longer like the world would a brother, but you treat him like the world would a tax collector and sinner. I can't eat with you. Not to even eat with such a one. He specifies, he goes, well, I'm not talking to those in the world who act like that. You can eat with them, but it's, it's the, the ones who claim that they're brothers don't eat with those, don't associate with them. There's actually another subset of this, and, and I'm thinking of 1 Thessalonians 5, or sorry, there is no 1 first, first Thessalonians, is this 1 Thessalonians? I think that's 2 Thessalonians, right? Uh, 3, 10 through 15. For even when we were with you, we used to command this to you. If anyone is not willing to work, neither let him eat. So if somebody in the church is saying, hey, I need your hospitality because I'm in need. And you say, how's work going? Oh, I'm not working. Are you looking for a job? Nope. Or they say they are and they're not. Like if, if they're not willing to work, if they are lazy, if they're busy bodies, walking in an unruly manner, uh, Paul says, uh, we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus that instead Christians ought to work with quietness, eating their own bread. We read in Ephesians, working so that they can have something to share, not not working so that they can take from the church. And for this subset in verse 15, it says, and yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right? So, we ought not be taken advantage of with our hospitality. This command is not a command to enable people to sin because of your hospitality. Don't partner with false teachers. Don't associate with people who say, I'm a brother, but their life totally doesn't match and they're not walking in repentance. If you see a brother who's fallen into sin, you say, brother, come over to my house. Let me plead with you to repent. That is a great use of your home. Have them into your home, plead with them to repent and help them walk in repentance. But if they prove to you that they are not a brother who's willing to walk in repentance, even after, especially after you've shown them genuine love, 
There's a process through which the church is to rightly have nothing to do with them, to not have them in our home. And even as we're walking with them in that process, not to enable them in their sin through use of our home. Hospitality is used to spread the gospel message, not to confuse it. Hospitality, Christian hospitality is a demonstration of faith. Right, we don't just say we love, but we must actually do it. It's remarkable how often in the Bible, hospitality is the litmus test of whether or not you have true Christian, of whether or not you have true faith. I'll just read you 1 John 3, 17. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It doesn't. If you use your stuff in love, mark that you're a Christian. You don't use your stuff in love to earn God's favor. But if you've been a recipient of gospel, of God's reconciling love in the gospel, you will use your stuff to show love to your brothers. Compare James 2.15. If a brother or sister is without clothing, I don't think it's just odd. It, it, it's not a, a coincidence that brother, sister is in every one of these verses. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says, okay, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And then James asks, can that faith save you? You say, I have faith, I don't have works. And the work in particular that's lacking is meeting needs of a brother or sister in need. That faith can't save you. You actually revealed through your lack of love and the way you refuse to use your stuff, you revealed what you truly believe about the gospel. Similarly, and I already read it, Matthew 25, what you did to the least of these, my brothers, you've done to me. And if you see a brother or sister in need and you refuse, that's evidence you're more like a goat than a sheep. This kind of hospitality that we've described is consistently put forth in the Bible, not as a means of earning salvation, but rather a demonstration of faith that always accompanies grace. We are saved by faith, not works, not hospitality, but hospitality is a critical test for genuine faith. Hospitality is the norm for godly Christians. That's why it's called out as a requirement for elders. Hospitality is a natural and necessary demonstration of faith in the gospel. And finally, hospitality must be God glorifying. God's glory is the goal of our salvation, Ephesians 1 1 and 2, and it's the goal of our hospitality, 1 Peter 4, 11, right? After those commands, we walk through 1 Peter 4, 9 through 10. That ends, right? We have the three one another commands. And then what? In order, verse 11, that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory, dominion forever and ever. Is there an obvious and conscious connection between your loving service and hospitality and God's glory? Who gets the glory in your heart when you put on a a great meal, have someone over? Whose glory are you aiming for? Do you like it when the other person says, oh man, you're so great? Say, praise God. God gets the glory and mean it. So when you consider hospitality, I pray that you are actually motivated to go be hospitable. When you consider hospitality to Christians, do not think first and most about the what. You're going to have to figure out the what. Pour the how, but think about the why. When we were far off, when we were strangers to God and we had no right to call him father, We had no claim to his family. He adopted us as sons and daughters at great cost to himself. And now we ought to remember God's love towards strangers, towards us, 
and then be defined by brotherly love towards those who are once strangers to us, but now are our blood-bought brothers and sisters. These are high aims. They're impossible aims without saving grace. But by God's grace, may we, especially we at Grace Bible Church, be marked by this kind of gospel love, imitating, revealing, and spreading hospitality. God, thank you for your love for us. I pray that you would make us people who show that love to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.